This video demonstrates one of a set of biological forecasting and hindcasting tools that are our shiny apps, web apps of uh, different aspects of the niche mapper package. And this one is the first one in the series, and it's looking at one of the microclimate models. It's this first one here called the Global Soil Microclimate Calculator. I'm going to click on the link, and it's going to bring up the app. Now, these apps are live running the um, R package on a server at the University of Melbourne. And what's what's happening now is it's running a calculation. Uh, so there's a pause at the moment while it, while it runs a calculation, then you'll see some results pop up. And there are a series of microclimate um, apps. Um, they all have a similar setup. We have um, the settings on the left-hand side and some outputs on the right-hand side and a map uh, allowing you to choose a location on the right-hand side as well. Um, and so on the left-hand side, you've got the big blue run, run model button. Um, you've got the location, which you can actually type in as coordinates if you want. But like I say, there's also this little map here, which allows you to put the coordinate um, to actually go anywhere in the world and click uh, on a location and, and run a simulation for that location. Uh, and then you have some controls about uh, what month you're going to plot in this particular app and the height um, that you're aiming for in terms of animal height, the microclimate height uh, of interest, and some options as to what uh, soil depths to plot. And then there are more parameters, or well, there's, there's an offset here to um, change the, to add or subtract a certain level of warming or cooling on the overall climate. And then there's a, a checkbox here, which will show you some other parameters that you can change and also um, this button here, which will give you some options about saving input and output and getting the code out. So this app is running from a global monthly long-term average climatology. You can see it's uh, there's a link here to the paper that describes the climatic forcing data set. It's by New and colleagues, 2002. So it's a nine, it's centered on uh, between 1960 and 1990. And so it's that, that data set has got the, monthly conditions so it's it's running for the middle day of each month basically and uh what you can see as the first plot is the soil temperature and it's showing the soil temperature at different depths in the soil so we've got the y-axis is the temperature and we've got the x-axis is the hour of the day and it's just plotting this one day middle day typical january day in the middle of uh middle day of january and uh you can see there's a series of points, so different depths. You can see that the legend here is showing the depths, and we can choose which depths are being plotted here on the left-hand side. So there are more depths than that can be plotted than are shown. And you'll see the typical looking uh, soil temperature profile, um, which is you know, quite biologically interesting. If you haven't actually seen one of these sorts of plots before, you can see the very surface temperature in red, which is getting quite hot. This is, um, I should say, where this simulation is. It's at this particular place here in the centre of Australia, a big, um, big rock called Uluru. And you can see on the map, um, we're actually on the edge of Uluru, right on the edge. Uh, just, to, just to locate you in Australia, this is where we are. Okay, so I'll zoom right in there. Okay, so that's, that's where the simulation is. And you can see in January, on a typical day in January, and this is right on the edge of the rock, we would expect the rock temperature to get up to about uh, 50 degrees in the middle of January, about just before midday. And then at night, it's dropping down to just under 20. So that's the surface temperature of the soil. Um, and then you can see that the amplitude of the, of the temperature wave or the, the temperature cycle through the day is becoming damped as, as you go deeper and deeper. And also, the, the timing of the maximum is happening later and later and later. So this, this is a very typical thing that happens with soil temperatures as you go down in, in depths. And uh, as once you get down to about 50 centimetres, which is this line here, you're not seeing any diurnal signal anymore. You're just seeing what's roughly the mean monthly temperature there. And there's actually, you can actually go down to a metre, which is that line there, and then two metres, which is that line there. And two metres in this simulation is a, is a boundary condition and it's the mean annual temperature actually. So that's what, what this is. It's actually not calculated. It's assumed that at two meters, you've got the mean annual temperature and then it's doing a physical calculation of heat transfer through the soil, depending on what's going on above ground, how much solar radiation is hitting the ground, how much is being absorbed, 
what the wind speed is, what the air temperature is, what the humidity and what the infrared radiation environment is. All of that is being used to calculate the diurnal temperature cycle um, at the different months of the year. So that's that's January. We can choose um, June and you can see um, we have much cooler cooler temperatures. I mean, it's not, it's not that much cooler. It's, it is getting up to about 50 degrees in the middle of the day. Um, but the temperature at uh, five centimetres is getting up to about 30, whereas I think before it was getting more like 40. So um, it's a hot place. It's a very sunny place. Um, and you're seeing you know, quite high temperatures. So soil temperature is one of the interesting things that we can calculate with these models. And it's one of the more sophisticated things about this particular model, how it, how it can calculate soil temperature. But of course, it's not just calculating soil temperature. It's also calculating a number of other microclimatic factors um, above the ground. So you can see in this plot here, we've got the air temperature. Uh, then we've got the relative humidity on the, on the right-hand side. And we've got the wind speed, bottom left, and the solar radiation on the right. With the air temperature, humidity, and wind speed, you can see there are two lines. One of them is the 1.2 meter um, air temperature, and the other one is the chosen height, one centimeter. So the, the dashed blue line is what a weather station would measure, whereas the, the black line is our chosen animal height um, or plant height, uh, one centimeter. And you can see for air temperature at one centimeter above the ground, it's actually warmer during the day uh, and, and, it, and it's colder at night at that height above the ground. And you can see the wind speed is much higher, um, 1.2 metres above the ground compared to at one centimetre. That should make sense because eventually when you get to the actual surface, the, the air is, is no longer moving. It's kind of because of friction. And then this is relative humidity. And what's I, I, there's only, I think, um, one value of humidity per day, essentially, in terms of the actual vapour pressure of the atmosphere in this data set. But um, what's happening is the temperature is changing, and so the, the relative humidity is changing through the day um, as, a, as a consequence. So you can see that the relative humidity is higher for the uh, in, during the day for the weather station height because the air is cooler, um, whereas if you warm that air up down near the surface, uh, it can actually hold more moisture, relatively speaking, and so the relative humidity is lower. So these are aspects of the um, microclimate that are important for solving an animal heat budget. And then, of course, the solar radiation is critically important. So um, in these plots, you can see there's these dashed lines showing the timing of sunrise and sunset. So that's being calculated by the model. There's a full solar radiation model going on in this um, program that's starting with the solar constant at the... Um, top of the atmosphere, the, the total amount of energy that the sun is uh, projecting that's hitting the top of the atmosphere, and then it's calculating how that's being curtailed as uh, the sun goes through, the sunlight goes through the atmosphere. And it also depends, of course, on the latitude and longitude and time of day. Um, so it works out the, the total solar radiation, how that's attenuated by the atmosphere, and that includes the effect of cloud cover. And uh, in... Uh, Central Australia, there's not a lot of cloud cover, so we have relatively high um, rel uh, radiation. So we're getting up towards about 800 watts per metre squared here. That's what the units are for the solar radiation. So that's on horizontal ground. It's giving you the output for horizontal ground, even though it might be looking at a sloping surface. This is the, the what it gives as output to, is for horizontal ground. Um, and you, you can see that there's a little bit of sunlight just before the official sunrise when the sun peaks up over the over the horizon. Um, and then as soon as the sun's risen, then the solar radiation starts to go up dramatically. Um, and then you can see something interesting here where at about two o'clock, there's suddenly, after two o'clock, there's suddenly no radiation. And the reason for this is that this calculation is based on some fine scale topography from a 30 meter resolution digital elevation model. And you can see the, the resolution of that digital elevation model here. This is, this is, um, the region that we're we're looking at, the, the location is right here in the center. And uh, now I'll show you some of the extra parameters, which include some of these terrain parameters. So I click on here and you can see that um, the slope is at 70 degrees. So we're actually right on the edge of, of the um, outcrop here. And it's facing north, 25 degrees north is, is north, roughly speaking. Um, and so that's partly controlling the amount of solar radiation because we're on this angle. But also you can see there's a whole lot of circles here. The, M 
The empty circles indicate that it's zero degrees to the horizon. Basically, you're just looking at the horizon in those directions. But as you look towards the rock, of course, the angle to the horizon is much steeper. The rock's in the way of the sun. And so the model is calculating how the sun is being blocked by the surrounding topography. And so that's what's happening here. You're getting uh, all of a sudden at about um, at this time of the day, at this location, just after two o'clock, the sun would get blocked and you would just have diffuse sunlight hitting, hitting this area. Um, so that's that's controlling also the soil surface temperature. Um, and we can see the, the effect of those terrain, um, terrain effects if we actually turn off the fine scale topography and just model a completely flat surface. And we can do that by unchecking this box here, the fine scale topography box. So if we uncheck that, and then we can reset all of all the um, settings to default settings. So that takes the horizon angle to zero, um, the slope to zero and the aspect to zero. And then we can hit the run button and we'll get the calculation for completely flat ground. And you see now the temperature is getting a lot higher. Uh, it's getting up to about 65 degrees, the surface temperature in the middle of the day. And uh, now you can see down here, the solar radiation is more uniformly distributed throughout the day in a, in a symmetrical kind of plot. And remember before when I went to June, um, it was getting quite hot. That's because it's a north facing slope and um, in the southern hemisphere in the winter, uh, north facing slopes get warmer. Whereas if we go to June now, you'll see it's actually quite a lot colder. It's only getting up, not even um, maybe about 35 degrees there. Um, okay, so there are a few other controls here. I, the, the horizon angle here you can control. Um, when, you, when you use the fine scale topography, it will actually work out the horizon angle in all those different directions, as you saw. But if you change the horizon angle, um, not using the fine scale topography, then um, it will just change the horizon angle in every direction. You've got a, a multiplier on the wind speed. So that will allow you to get an idea of, um, say you're in a situation where there's a, there's a, you're in a forest, for instance, and the wind is being curtailed by the forest, you can drop the wind speed down. And if you're interested in, in what would happen if it got windier, you can increase the wind speed. Uh, you can change the surface albedo or the reflectivity of the surface. Um, so you could make it a mirror if you changed it to 100%, or if you made it zero, then you're making it completely black. You can change the emissivity of the surface, which is affecting the long wave radiation outwards. You can change the thermal conductivity of the substrate, um, and you can change the heat capacity of the substrate and the density of the mineral part of the substrate as well as the bulk density. So the soil itself is a, is a mixture of minerals, mineral particles, air and water. And uh, this is controlling the thermal conduct. This thermal conductivity is controlling the thermal conductivity of the mineral component of the soil. Same with the heat capacity, the mineral component of the soil and the, and the density. And then the bulk density says how much air is in the soil. So this is roughly uh, because it's about half the actual mineral density, we've got a, a soil that's about half air and half um, mineral particles. And that space of air can fill up with moisture, potentially. Um, and, and there is a soil moisture model, which we can look at in one of the other apps. The soil moisture model isn't running here. Soil moisture is accounted for through a global soil moisture data set. So it is actually accounting for seasonal patterns in soil moisture inherently, but you can't control it and you can't change the soil type and so on like you can in the other apps. So these are some of the parameters you can control. Uh, you can also control the shade um, and um, you can put an organic cap on the surface of the soil. That's what this checkbox does and that box does. And that um, can often make temperatures in grassy areas or areas with just a bit of vegetation cover much more realistic. Um, but you would have this unchecked if you were looking at it, say a, a just completely barren sandy surface. Um, you can also query the uh, soil grids data set. I'll, we'll look at that a little bit later in one of the other apps. And just out of interest, you can you can run the simulation with a clear sky just to see what the clear sky solar would look like. Um, so let's just try another location just out of interest. Let's go um, somewhere cold, somewhere somewhere up in the um, the highlands around, I'm not sure where we are here, the pool or somewhere. I run the simulation there. 
Now you can see it's changed the latitude and longitude. And you can see it's it's very, very cold. Um, actually, what you can see, this model also has a snow module. And uh, you can see that snow is present all year round here. That's what these gray bars are. And they're keeping the soil temperature very close to zero, except for in the very coldest months where it actually gets even colder than zero. So the, the soil temperature near the surface is staying close to zero because um, this, there's, a, there's a transition happening in phase of the water. So um, while it's in that transition, it stays around zero. But once it's finished freezing, then it can go colder than that. So you can see um, that, that it's, uh, it's a very cold place. Um, in January, if we go to June, uh, you'll see that actually the snow does melt um, and you get a, a little bit of um, a bit of warmth in the soil. So um, air temperatures here are not getting above minus five, and um, the solar radiation is very low. Um, so they're the main controls of this app. And then um, I'll just show you one other aspect in, in this particular video about what you can do about getting um, output and saving your input. So you can, if you want, save your parameters. You click on this, um, it saves the uh, input data. And then you can read that in up the top here. You can browse for parameters and find that file. And um, it's in my downloads. Uh, if I just load that, then it will, um, you can see that um, it, it will read those parameters back in to say if you've got some parameters you want to, we want to get back really quickly. So that's what that does. And if we click on this, save output soil temperature, we'll get a file that has the soil temperatures in it. So you'll get a file that has the, the day, the, the time of day, and then at each different depth, what the soil temperature is. And in the if you click on this, you'll get the above ground conditions, the microclimate CSV file. So that'll give you um, a, a file that has the air temperature at the weather station height, which will be called TA ref, and the air temperature at the local height that you chose, TA lock. Same with the relative humidity and the wind speed, it will give you the solar radiation. It will also give you the snow depth, things like the sky temperature. The model calculates um, the, the dew formation, so you get dew and various other things. So that will be um, pretty obvious. And if you go into the help um, on the, um, the the help website for Niche Mapper or in the package, the help you'll see um, what all the outputs mean in more detail. Okay, so that's the microclimate model um, using the global um, long-term monthly conditions. And um, in the next video, I'll show you one that does um, daily historical calculations um, across a whole year.